it is our job to turn this world into a dwelling place for God. God is not asking us to create the world, to protect its existence, to defend its existence. God can take care of that all by himself. <laughs> he can. And he, and he wants to. What he wants from us, something much more noble. Don't create heaven and earth. Turn heaven and earth into a godly place. In a sense, it's a bigger ambition. Certainly not less, not a lesser ambition. And that part is not only doable, but it's the part that only we can do. God cannot make this world into a dwelling place for him. Because a dwelling place means the place where you are welcomed, where you know you belong because the place and those who are there welcome you, recognize your presence as being appropriate and correct and so on. Like when we talk about a home, a dwelling place. God wants a dwelling place. Well, the whole world is his world. It's his creation. It's his place. What needs to happen for God to be comfortable and for the world to be his dwelling place? It isn't now. He's everywhere. He fills the world. It's his world. What's missing? What is it that we're supposed to do to make the world a dwelling place for him? Obviously, there's a difference between a, a building, a house, versus a home. You can walk into a house, can even be your house, but it's not a home either because there's no one else there. You come home to your house and you're the only one who lives there. It's not a home. It's yours. It's a building. It's a house. And it's your house. But it's not a dwelling place. It's not a home because there's no one there. It's an empty shell. So yes, God created the whole world. And yes, he fills the whole world but if it's just him, then there is no dwelling place. It's not a home. It's just a place. To make the world into a dwelling place, you have to have people. There has to be someone that shares that space with you. Number two, those who share that space with you have to be completely in harmony with you or you disturb the, the peace in the home. So by having others there, it becomes a home rather than a house. But is it a pleasant home? Is it a peaceful home? Is it what a home is supposed to be? Well, let's take a look. What does it feel like when you come home? Home, home. Let's look at the opposite. What if you can't get home? It's a common nightmare that people have, by the way. Maybe you've had it too. You have these dreams where you're traveling to get home and nothing works nothing works you can't get home it's a terrible painful emptiness so coming home would have to be the opposite i can't i can't get over the beauty 
and the appropriateness of the Israeli soldiers who burst into the airport in Entebbe to save the hostages. I think the first word they said was stay down, which was good advice. But what they said to the hostages was so perfect, so instinctively correct. What, what would be the right thing to say? These people were being held there, were being tortured with uncertainty and with... What, what would be the, the perfect, the most appropriate words for the soldiers to say to the hostages. And they said it. They simply said, let's go home. There really is nothing, nothing in our entire vocabulary that could have been more appropriate, more true, more correct, more powerful than that. When you're a hostage, when you're being held in a strange place, what's more valuable, what's more urgent, what is more pleasurable than let's go home? We can go home. We have a home. and we can get there. There's nothing more powerful than that. So when God says, I created this world because I need it to be a dwelling place for me, he can't do that. He cannot make the world his home, which would mean that he feels com whatever it is people feel when they can go home. Home where you, where you belong, your place, um, not just a place, and not just a place that belongs to you legally, rightfully. It's something much, much more sensitive and much more delicate than that. In other words, God is completely dependent on us in only this area. He doesn't need us to help him create the planet. He doesn't need us to help him maintain the planet. And even if there was something we could do to destroy it, he can just as easily prevent it. He doesn't need our help. So when it says in the beginning of the Torah, in Bereshis, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and conquer it, or master it. He didn't mean make the world exist. There's a much deeper, much more profound way of mastering nature. And that is, giving nature its divine purpose, bringing out within nature the divine potential that it has. This lowest world, this physical, material, often dark and nasty world, is capable of being more pleasurable to God than the highest heaven. Because here, he can have a home. There, he has a heaven. Heaven can never be home. So, the moral of the story of the people who built the, the, uh, the, the tower, or who tried to build the tower, it was so far fablungit, so distracted from everything that we're supposed to be doing, that God had to stop it. 
it would take too long for people to realize their mistake and then correct their mistake. So God said, no, I'm not going to let you waste all your time and all your energy for hundreds of maybe even a thousand years before you, you recover from this distraction. And so how did he stop it? All of a sudden, different groups of people working on this project found themselves speaking a different language. So the cooperation that they had that made it possible to build that tower was suddenly gone. They couldn't cooperate. They didn't understand each other. All of a sudden, they became strangers. And so naturally, people who found themselves speaking a common language went off and created their own country. So it's the language that creates the country. It's not the country that creates a language. So it's not like people move, move to Germany because it's Germany, and then they create a language appropriate to Germany. Those who spoke German created a country, and of course it was called Germany. Interesting take on history. So how appropriate is it that God stopped the project by distracting them from the project? Their sin was that they were distracted from their purpose, from their mission, to what seemed to be a very noble project. Let's fix this world, but like carpenters, <laughs> scaffolding, let's shore it up and make it stable. And God said, wait, 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 that's not what I need from you. <clears throat> and so by separating their languages and thereby separating their communities, uh, it seemed like human life had had slipped to a to a lower level when they all spoke the same language and were all cooperating on a project the unity the oneness and the cooperation were impressive beautiful but until people know what their purpose is, their ability to work together can be a very negative thing. Which tells us another, what should unite people? We dream of world peace. We dream of a time when all people will, will be not only cooperating, but united in a common life purpose. How does that happen? What does it take for uh, mankind, humankind, to become once again cooperative, but this time the right way? Speaking the same language is a powerful uniting factor. If there was only one language in the entire universe, we, we would cooperate, we would get along much better. But to what end? Would we know what to do with this unity, harmony, cooperation? What would we do with it? The Rebbe once said to somebody, my father-in-law suffered from a lack of money all the projects that he needed to do, bringing people out of Europe, t paying the teachers and the cheder, it was, it was difficult. There was no money, none. It was an uphill struggle. But he had people to work with. The Rebbe said, I have access to money, but who am I working with? This was back in the, in the early 60s. Thank God a, a generation grew up and the Rebbe had who to work with. But the, the point is, you have 
you have the 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 the, the, the needs you have the means but you forgot what the purpose was so unity cooperation um harmony in the world would be a wonderful thing if we don't get distracted so that's interesting that the story of the tower which is usually glossed over we don't make much of a deal about the, you know the flood well that's a lot of, a lot is said about the flood egypt the slavery coming out of egypt a lot but that tower thing it's a brief little mention in the torah we don't really understand what they were doing it, it doesn't seem to be so relevant but of course it's in the torah so it is relevant so one of the things that it tells us is that imagine world peace what a wonderful concept what a beautiful picture what a magnificent condition if human beings would just get along torah comes and says there was a time all human beings got along and they forgot what they were getting along for it's a powerful powerful lesson in each community where people do get along is that oneness is that union serving its purpose the united states e pluribus unum beautiful for what so what really unites people the common language we've had that a common project we've had that it was bad what really should unite people and what will unite people when mashiach comes so that the world will really be a utopian world is is the purpose for which we exist when there's harmony in that when all people are committed to serving the purpose for which they exist then you have a harmony that cannot go bad you cannot be distracted and then there will never be another problem and that's what we're looking forward to when we talk about the days of mashiach of course the days of mashiach means an end to suffering and an end to pain and an end to illness and an end to war but that's those are just the details those are just the symptoms the real blessing of the days of mashiach is every human being devoted to the pursuit of the purpose for which we exist that is better than good gooder than good and from there there's there's no there's no there's no downside you can't go bad after that and so the world will be permanently good not just having a good you know, a good season so it is amazing once again how things in torah that seem to be a little a little strange a little out of our experience and therefore not really relevant to us in our lives there's no such thing we look a little deeper we look a little more honestly and we find that it is so relevant every word in torah every story in torah every mitzvah in torah so first of all we need to learn torah second of all we need to be so grateful and therefore happy because happiness is the theme of this month of course 
um, that we were given the Torah, that we were given our purpose, that we were invited to be God's partners in creation, which is such a huge, it means, it means so much more than meets the eye being God's partner in creation. Husband and wife are partners in creation. But what does the word partner mean in a marriage? An agreement? Division of labor? What, what, what does partner mean? It's far more romantic than the word partner suggests. But we are God's partner in the full sense of the word in, in this creation. Without us, the planet has no purpose, has no value, has no appeal to God. He is a creator only because of what the world can become. And that involves us. So where's the joy? Where's the enthusiasm? Where is the commitment? Where is the the pleasure just of, of being included. So whether I'm a Bainani, I'm not such a Bainani, I'm a big Russia, a little Russia, a big sinner, a full-time sinner, a little sinner, it, it becomes petty in comparison. I can do a mitzvah. I can do a mitzvah. If we appreciate the full power of that, we, we would never be unhappy. We would never have an excuse to be unhappy. Because the joy of life, the joy of partnering with God, makes everything else look childish, petty. And that's why we don't focus on fighting the evils of the world. When you can do a mitzvah, your weaknesses, your failings, your, your character flaw. Oh, come on. That's so petty. Yes, yes, they're all true, but they're all so petty. Imagine you're walking down the street uh, on the beach and you're lost in thought and you're thinking, is there a program that I can go to that will help me organize my life? I'm so disorganized. I could, I could accomplish so much more if I could just get organized. But, I, but I, I, I'm not good at it. Or you're walking down the beach and you're thinking, I, I got to get control of my life. I'm out of control. I indulge every passion. I eat every garbage that I know I shouldn't be eating. I'm making myself sick. I need some discipline. I need some self-control. Or you're walking down the beach and you're thinking, I'm so bad. I don't do right by my by my family. I don't do right by my spouse. I don't do right by my friends. When did I become such a nasty, selfish individual? Serious thoughts, right? As you're thinking these thoughts, you hear somebody crying. They're drowning. They can't swim. What happens with all your thoughts? You're standing there. The person is drowning. The person is thrashing around in the water, crying for help. And you're thinking, oh, the poor guy. But, you know, I got my problems. I need to become more disciplined. I need to become more organized. I got to become a better friend to my friends. So, um, you know, we're in the same boat. He's got his problems. I got my problems. Isn't that insane? That ridiculous? If somebody is calling for your help, the thoughts you are carrying 
that seemed so heavy, so important, so valuable, so necessary. As selfish as you are, as disorganized as you are, and as undisciplined as you are, pull that person out of the water. And what about your disorganization? What about your lack of discipline? Oh, come on. Save it. Nobody cares. You saved a life. So you see how all these thoughts about ourselves being a benani, a rasha, a tzaddik, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm a little good, I'm not so good. Oh, come on. There's a mitzvah right there in front of you. And you can do this for God. And you're going to stand there saying, well, God has his needs. I have my needs. <laughs> no, no, no. Not according to the Rebbe. Not according to Hasidus. Of course you have problems. Of course you're imperfect. Of course you have your flaws. And if you had free time and nobody needed your help and God didn't create you for any other purpose, yeah, it would be very nice to sit there and try to improve your character and your inner person. And Yeah, yeah, sure. But in the presence of a purpose for which you are created, don't get hung up. Get to the end of the Tanya. Get to the end. Don't get stuck in the middle where it's talking about you and your imperfections. Of course, it's good to know so that it liberates you, so that you can apply yourself to the purpose for which we exist wholeheartedly with enthusiasm and with pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, We are at a very exciting time in history. Don't, don't believe the headlines. The world is not going down. The good stuff never gets reported. It's a very exciting time in history. Every mitzvah you do is crucial. The cup is almost full. A few more drops, a few more drops, and the cup is full. And when the cup is full, we have arrived, we have achieved, the world will become what it is meant to be. So it, again, a pleasure talking to you. Um, Fill the world, fill your life, fill your day, fill your thoughts with the only thing that is really valuable, really godly, and really necessary. To serve God. To make the world a dwelling place for Him by becoming His. That's it. Not as easy as it sounds, but definitely as exciting as it sounds. So have a great night, have a great Shabbos, and a great month. And um, we should all celebrate Purim to the maximum, because the world will be, by then, looking really good. Good night. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. I want to invite you to join us as VIPs, partners in our work and join us also for uh, a personal chat. 
with other members of the VIP club. We talk about many things. There's an opportunity to ask, to respond, to make a comment, to meet the other supporters. And together we can really make a difference in Jewish life and in life in general. So join us. It's good to know org. Log in, call, make contact, and join us with the VIPs.